It's such a privilege and an honor to be here today to um, thank in public and acknowledge the debt I owe to Stu, Myron, Bob, and I think yesterday there were one or two others. <clears throat> um, I always thought it was my good fortune, incredible good fortune, to have landed here at MIT in 1970. But yesterday, listening to Harriet, I understood the difference between good fortune and serendipity. And I think now I will modify my assessment and say it was real serendipity to land up here. You know, to understand why I call it that, you have to imagine my situation. I was in India in, the, in 1969 with no idea, absolutely no idea of graduate school in finance. Some of my friends had gone to graduate school in engineering, but I had no idea because I knew of nobody who had gone to graduate school in finance or economics. And based on completely random criteria, I chose to come to MIT. You know, it was absolutely no information at all. And I was then plunged into this process of marination that Stu described. My first, let's say, um, dunk into the, into the vinegar or whatever is marinated was my exposure to Myron. And, you know, I said to myself, this guy is so smart, but I cannot understand half of what he says, you know. So it took me a while to really figure out what he was trying to say. And, you know, there was a lot of very fancy things. And the real, I would say, trial by fire was to go to Franco Modigliani's workshop if I remember correctly, it was on Wednesdays in those days. In the evening, my stomach was growling because it was dinner time. And I was there, I had no clue what people were saying. Absolutely no clue. And all I could recall from those days was, Franco, of course, would jump up five minutes after the speaker started and grab the chalk and start writing something on the board. And Myron would also say something. And of course, Stu was very quiet most of the time when he had something particularly important to say and then you had to pay real attention. And the, for me, the high point of those seminars was those gems that Bob would drop from time to time. I said, wow, that clarifies the whole thing. I mean, it was, and then I had the good fortune to take, like many of you, immense good fortune, to take uh, Bob's 415, I thought I had a different number, but people referred to it as 415, so maybe that's what it was, with those uh, blue notes. And the clarity and precision of those notes. These are just notes. This is not a textbook. But I dare say they were more consistent in notation and much, much better organized than most textbooks. I mean, and, and this was the first version because I was in the first class with Bob along with Victor. Uh, Victor Menezes sitting in the back here. And the, you had to go back and look at each lecture and think about it very carefully. And it was, it was an amazing uh, uh, experience to go through that course. Thereafter, I was a bit of a, at a loss because the campus, like many campuses in 1971-72, was convulsed with all the goings on in Vietnam and later on Cambodia. And I was completely confused and was not able to really focus. That is just what, I, what had happened. And I wasn't sure what I was doing. Thankfully, I didn't think about dropping out like some others did. I stuck, hung in there. And thanks to the patience of Stu, Bob, and Myron, I managed to stay. And I came up during the summer of 1972 with an idea, which was a crazy idea. And I went and talked to Myron. I don't know if he remembers this. Myron and then later on Bob. And Myron said, why don't you present it in Franco's seminar? Which I thought, my god, this is a terrifying thing. How am I going to do this? So I go to the seminar and present it. And about three, four lines into the proof that I was writing, I realized I'd made a big mistake, big mistake. I was 
absolutely demolished. And I didn't know what to do. Bob said, you come to my office afterwards. I went to Bob's office. He took me under his wing and basically figured out the whole thing. He figured out the whole thing. And he also told me, when you write this, you have to write it very carefully. Why? Because we were challenging the giants of finance. Joe Stiglitz, Mike Jensen, these were some of the biggest names in financial economics of all time, and uh, defined broadly. And in my brash and youthful enthusiasm, I was very critical of what they had said. Bob said, no, that's not how you say it. You have to re be very, very careful and precise and do not use any pejorative expressions when you criticize other people. And that was incredibly useful advice, which I've tried to maintain to this day, that even when you have an academic argument, you have to be very polite and not get carried away by the strength of your arguments, et cetera. And um, one of the things that uh, happened thereafter, of course, we talked, we learned yesterday about Paul McAvoy and uh, Bell Journal. And uh, I was fortunate to be Paul McAvoy's research assistant. Somebody said that he paid Bob $500 for the rational theory paper for publishing it. As a reviewer, and that was $500 in relation to $11,000 salary, I got paid $250 as a reviewer on an assistantship of $5,000 or $4,000, whatever it was in those days. And for me, this was like unbelievable good fortune that I would suddenly earn $250. And I remember when the check came for the, our joint paper in the Bell Journal, um, it $250. I thought there was manna from heaven, you know, that it was uh, unbelievable good fortune. Um, Bob was among the masters of economics of the second half of the 20th century and continues to be today. And studying under him and Myron and Stu and all the other greats of the MIT economics department, Samuelson, Solo, Modigliani, Diamond, many others. I dare say my cup is full. I think that uh, the, one of the greatest things that I enjoyed in my life was really my good fortune arriving here when I did, because that was the golden era of MIT, 1970, the 70s, basically. And uh, for this, I really thank Bob, Stu, Myron, and many others. Um, it's hard for me not to get emotional about it, but that's what it is. Now I got that out of the way, I'll turn to my paper. Um, this paper I chose because when Zui asked me to speak, I said, let me think about a paper among my current working papers that best illustrates what I learned from Bob. And you'll see as I go through the paper that it's really uh, telling you about um, the sorts of things that he invented for the most part. And now it has become so much part of the language of finance. It's like his father. Today, when people use those ideas, they don't know it's Bob's. You know. It's sort of merged into a collective sort of consciousness as financial economists. So when people use it, I sometimes point out to people, you know, that is Merton's. And they don't even know they're using it. They don't even know that it's Bob's. So that's basically, I think, uh, where, um, you know, when somebody, you know, whether it's Shakespeare or Robert K. Merton or Robert C. Merton, uh, you know, when it, uh, when it becomes, <laughs> when nobody knows, uh, you know, that, that expression is, you know, owes its origins to, to somebody like that, and then peace, they have achieved greatness. Um, so with that, uh, let me turn to my, my paper here, um, which is um, joint work with uh, Suleiman Bashak at LBS, uh, Dmitry Bakarov in, at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and Alex Shapiro, who has a courtesy appointment, but is actually the chief risk officer of Bank Hapoli in, in Israel. So 
this paper had its origins a long time ago, and it's been sort of in the making for really a long time, really. It's based on, um, again, inspired by one of Bob's pet peeves. Best expressed in his presidential address at the American Finance Association many years ago, where Bob said, you know, it's very easy to appeal to asymmetry of information or behavioral kind of assumptions to explain phenomena that we observe. But before we do so, why don't we use market frictions or other identifying so, uh, identifiable sources of these frictions to explain the very same phenomena? And that is what he did. And for instance, transactions cost or taxes or other frictions of that type. And this is very much in the spirit of Bob's thinking in, the, in this area. So before we rush to appealing to imperfections or even behavioral uh, uh, kind of explanations, which often are very hard to refute, actually, using the scientific method, whereas th these are, they, they are refutable, I think. Um, so what is the intuition of this paper? The intuition is that it's commonly observed that many people in poor countries, and it's very much true in India in my experience, or even poor people in wealthy countries, that they buy lottery tickets. And there's so many of them all over the world. And everybody knows this is an unfair gamble, and yet people buy lottery tickets. Why? Well, the argument, simply put, is that if you have an extra dollar, you can buy uh, maybe an additional loaf, loaf of bread, which gives you some utility, but really not much more. But if you participate in this unfair gamble, you have a very tiny probability of getting over the hump and maybe buying your dream car or dream house or whatever, or something bigger, right? So this basically staying within sort of von Neumann, Morgenstern axioms, and yet explaining some behavior that we commonly witness. That, that's basically what it is. So we apply that to convertible securities. So we say, wh why do convertible securities exist? Now, what are convertible securities? Well, convertible securities are securities that have some hybrid feature, the part debt, part equity. And also, um, they are widely used in other structures, this kind of convertible structure. For instance, compensation schemes are quite often a combination of fixed salary and some kind of a option to participate in the equity. So this is kind of very, very general. And many people have argued that convertible securities are really an explanation. And we offer at least one alternative explanation. And it does not rely on asymmetric information or some behavioral explanation. Rather, it is in a world of full information, of no asymmetric information. And just by using this insight that there are people who participate in uh, unfair uh, gambles. So uh, this, our work is really using a dynamic framework in the spirit of Bob's work, and really goes back to work by Milton Friedman and Leonard Savage back in the 40s, where they posited a co convex concave utility function. So there is basically the utility functions are concave in most part, but there is a segment where they are convex. And that actually motivates, according to Friedman and Savage, this participation in unfair gambles. So essentially, we are using the same intuition. What do, how do we use it? We say, well, here's the setup. The entrepreneur chooses how to finance the firm and how to manage it. So the entrepreneur has the technology. The financing is provided by a risk-averse financier. And the entrepreneur is key to the functioning of this firm, this project. That is to say, without her, the project cannot be undertaken by the financier. That's the assumption. We essentially use the setup to solve for the optimal security and try to show that it is very much like the convertible security that we're talking about. So we are claiming that our setup yields a structure, a payoff structure, which is very much akin to a convertible bond. Our model can explain, I think, 
why convertibles are used by startups and small firms, and it, this is very widely used in venture capital, for example, um, and also firms that have high volatility, where the payoffs are high, vol high volatile, and also, this goes back to some of the things that Stu said, the, where the firms have great need for flexibility over the life of the project. So the flexibility is a key thing. So we actually contrast the firm value dynamics when the manager manages the firm with this optimal security and without the optimal security. So we try to use that as a kind of a base case. We also believe that our results are useful for structural credit modeling. And as Bob has shown again amply, credit risk is an important consideration in security design. In fact, his 1975 paper is exactly about that. So there's a lot of literature, as you can see, on both convertibles and on status concerns. You know, I won't go through that. But this is, again, the classic uh, framework of uh, Bob's that has been adopted by many, many people, not just in financial economics, but more broadly. With one small twist, we introduce a choice variable uh, phi, which is the firm's riskiness, which is chosen by the entrepreneur. So th there is a flexibility in choosing this phi. And our interpretation of phi is that it is what we call product of a novelty, novelty of the product. An increase in novelty affects both the drift term as well as the diffusion term. That's how we model it. Then we have slightly more generalized versions as well, but that's the basic setup. So in this setup now, we use the uh, Friedman Savage kind of intuition, and we say that the status is captured via preferences with that convex segment. And the status increases from high to low when the wealth crosses a certain threshold. So beyond the threshold, again, is usual concave. Before it's concave, but there's a sort of kink in between. So when you're very far away from the kink, where it's a very low levels of wealth, then you behave like any other risk averse investor. But, and when, when you're well above the threshold, again, you behave like any other risk averse investor. But when you're close to the hump, then you might actually be behave differently. That's basically the intuition. And I have a paper way back, uh, almost 40 odd years ago, which really in the Journal of Economic Theory, which, where I actually showed this. And in fact, this paper is actually sort of based on that old, old intuition. So this is what it is, and I don't want to uh, bore you with so much, too much of a technical detail, but I need some. So it's basically the standard constant proportional risk aversion utility function. Below the threshold level L, and above the threshold level, but there is a status parameter that actually accounts for this, uh, this kink. And basically, depending on the parameterization of the alpha, that is the status parameter, you will see different shapes above the kink. So your willingness to really participate in, in unfair gambles will be influenced by that. So the, to finance the firm, the entrepreneur issues a security with a certain payoff. By the way, all this is very much what language I learned from Bob. Uh, and uh, the security is financed by the, the, the financier, with, again, a risk covers, uh, constant proportional risk covers and utility function. And the security has to provide the financier with his reservation utility. So there's a minimum level that below which he will not be willing to finance the, 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 the entrepreneur's project. So this is the uh, entrepreneur's uh, optimization problem to choose the payoff function as well as the fee, which is the uh, dynamically adjustable uh, novelty parameter or risk parameter. And that is the problem to be solved. And I won't go through all the technical details or the solution of the problem. But essentially, we solve for this optimal problem uh, and we can get a solution, but then we have to compute the riskiness numerically. So essentially, this is the, basically the result. The firm value as a function of the novelty parameter, 
Um, basically, uh, sorry, novelty parameter is a function of firm value. At very low levels, the riskiness is maintained constant. But when you are sort of close to that kink, that cause the convex region, you jack up the risk. You jack up the risk. That's optimal to do so. And again, when you pass the threshold, you bring it down again to more or less constant level. So that's essentially the pattern of the, uh, the dynamic adjustment of this novelty parameter in conjunction with the payoff function. So the key insight is that the security issuance decision does not materially affect the risk-taking incentives embedded in the Friedman Savage concave convex utility function. So our optimal solution looks like this, that is uh, on, the, on the left. So the dotted line is basically the, uh, the uh, linear sharing rule that I again learned in Bob's course when you have um, hyperbolic absolute risk aversion um, family of utility functions, you get these linear sharing rules and see constant proportional risk aversion as a particular case. But the moment you introduce this sort of variation in the preferences, you get this kind of convertible type of structure. I'm not saying it's exactly like a convertible, but kind of looks like that. What, is the, what are the features? There is an initial region that's kind of linear, and then you get to a threshold, and then it's kind of flattish, and again becomes linear beyond a point. And you can see, I'm claiming that it sort of reminds you of this kind of payoff function, which is a convertible bond, where you have uh, this part is where the firm is defaulting on its debt, this is a flat region where it's paid off like regular debt, and this is the region when you get the upside, okay? So that's basically we are claiming this is sort of motivating you, I'm oh, sorry, uh, I'll go back here. Uh, where you, is they are saying that this gives you a motivation for why uh, you have a, this convertible structure, uh, uh, which looks sort of like, our optimal thing looks like that convertible structure. So what we look at this and say, well, does it accord with the empirical evidence? And you can see that, uh, you know, venture capital firms use such structures widely. They have convertible preference or some variation of that. And there's a lot of evidence on that. And also in Stu's classic textbook with Dick Brealey and Franklin Allen, they also make similar argument that they tend to be used by highly volatile firms, speculative firms. So this is basically what it is. And we also show that the project volatility, of course, affects that nature of that uh, thing. The greater the project volatility, the more and more akin to the convertible security you get. So you move from the dotted line to the solid line, the more, so if you get very low, at the limit, if your project volatility becomes close to zero, you get more or less the linear sharing rule. But here you get the variation. Uh, so basically, we now t focus on the impact of this firm flexibility in this optimal contract. Uh, essentially, it is the ability to switch the, well, the risk parameter of the firm so we now solve the problem for the other extreme, where the firm is completely inflexible. That is, the technology cannot be changed dynamically, as was assumed in our first version. So we then solve for the linear sharing, the, the sharing rule. And in fact, it's obviously a complex solution. But now what you find is you get this upward sloping region and a downward sloping region, where basically the, the difference is the financier takes a negative stake in the firm when the entrepreneur is forced to accept him to more risk, and the mirror image is the standard risk sharing result. A positive stake reduces the risk by sharing it with the financier. So that's basically what is going on here. Now, what about the other sort of uh, extreme where you uh, are only able to optimize with regard to the riskiness, but you do not have any control on the security design? Okay, security design is given. You just um, um, try to optimize on the dynamic risk management as well. I'm talking about real risk management. And in fact, we solve that problem also, which is the other base case. So we started with changing two things, changing, then changing one at a time. And in fact, this is uh, uh, that uh, it shows that the firm value dynamics is key for structural credit risk mo modeling. And in fact, there's been uh, 
we, this links up again inspired by Bob's 1975 piece uh, that the credit risk is an important driver of optimal security design. So this is the solution, I won't bore you with all that. So basically, when you have no possibility of adjusting the security issuance, uh, you have to manage the, the risk uh, dynamically. And in fact, depending on the sort of age of the firm, how mature the firm is, and that's part of our model, you actually have this dynamics of the uh, risk management uh, of the firm as a function of the firm value. So essentially, we have, compared to the sort of no issuance case, we have two opposite forces that arise with security issuance. One is the risk is shared between the financier and the entrepreneur, uh, and the entrepreneur can therefore take more risk. That is very much in line with classical risk sharing. Um, again, going back to my memory of Bob's class, the Cass and Stiglitz and, and uh, other papers of that vintage. Um, depending on firm man maturity, and the other part is, of course, the participation constraint. You've got to make sure the financier is able to get his minimum reservation utility. And depending on the firm maturity, either force can dominate. So I think uh, I've given you an illustration of the power of Bob's ideas. Throughout this paper, we are using, I think, several types of ideas that, that Bob actually started in this whole field. One is, of course, the one that is most closely associated, the pioneering uh, introduction of the concept of geometric bounding motion and stochastic optimization using the Ito calculus. The other is appealing to linear versus nonlinear sharing rules, which is part of the design of the optimal contract. And at the same time, the, the influence of credit risk in motivating security design, which is a much broader topic. I think the other part of it is really the key concept from Bob's work and Myron's work, and along with Fish Black is that you can, through dynamic replication, mimic the characteristics of a complete market, even though the market is only constrained complete. So that is actually the key insight of, I think, of Black Scholes Martin. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've convinced you that today it is impossible to write down a theoretical model in financial economics, or indeed economics more broadly without relying heavily on one of or other of Bob's many, many contributions. Thank you. <laughs>